Hi, I'm Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook, Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, and today we are so excited. Joining us today are Essen Zafar, who from the Department of Homeland Security, Ambassador Michael Kozak, who is a senior advisor with the DRL, and also Eric Tween with the Department of Justice. And we're so excited to have you. Thank you this morning for joining us. Ambassador Kozak, Secretary Clinton in July announced Resolution 1618 that we would host an experts meeting. We're now hosting that meeting. What is Resolution 1618? Well, Resolution 1618 is a United Nations Human Rights Council resolution that passed by consensus, and it was the end of a long process to put aside disputes and instead to focus on the kinds of measures to advance religious freedom, freedom of expression that all countries could agree on. So that's what we're dealing with here is how to take those measures and turn them into concrete action. And this is the first of that implementation effort. Indeed. What is the, the deep belief of one person may be offensive to mm -hmm. someone else's uh, uh, religious views or uh, for people who have none, uh, also offensive to them. So it became a conflict between protecting people's individuals' religious freedom and on the other hand protecting their rights to uh, freedom of expression. And this became a very tense uh, issue, as you alluded to, over a decade, essentially almost. a decade in the, mm -hmm. in the United Nations. But last year, there was a real breakthrough in that we all said, look, instead of arguing about this issue of restricting speech and so on, on which there is not and never will be agreement mm -hmm. because of the different approaches of, of different countries, Let's look at the things we do agree on and how to implement those more effectively. So Resolution 1618 actually lays out about 12 specific uh, policy steps that when, when somebody does something that's deliberately hateful and hurtful towards uh, someone else's religions, that people should stand up and say something about it. Not put them in jail for saying it, but say, you know, that's, that's Terrible. So there was a consensus that was reached in March, is that correct? Exactly. Okay. And then there was also uh, in that uh, in that consensus right. document right. and these various steps were, were the kinds of programs that our colleagues here from uh, the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security uh, undertake to uh, do community outreach, to train uh, uh, government officials so that they uh, are non-discriminatory in the conduct of their own duties, to deal with discrimination in public accommodation and so on that is that that might occur and and uh, where legal measures are appropriate so that was the notion that came out of the the UN Human Rights Council uh, last March right but then as you alluded in July we got together and said you know we really need to implement this and the way to implement it isn't to have more diplomats having more conversations right. about text in the UN but instead let's get Start the people implementing yeah, it. Yeah, and let's get the people who do this for uh, a living in their their real lives, our departments of justice and homeland security and their counterparts from uh, we, I think we have uh, over 30 countries uh, represented well, here. Let me ask you this. The announcement was made to host this experts meeting in July. It was done with the OIC. What is the OIC's role in this particular conference and why host it now? Mhm. Mm the, the OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, had traditionally been the sponsor of the defamation resolution in the United Nations system, and they were in fact the sponsor of Resolution 1618, the, mm -hmm. the consensus resolution. Um, but in terms of this conference, it's a conference hosted by the United States, as Secretary Clinton offered. We're hoping that other countries will take up other aspects. We're dealing with two particular steps recommended in uh, Resolution 1618. Okay. So others will need to deal with some of the others, uh, other steps. Which brings us to why we have our wonderful gentlemen here. We're focusing on two particular areas. We have the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. Um, Eric Treen, tell us what your role has been in these three days. I've watched you with such finesse, um, wonderful moderator, wonderful contributor and presenter. Tell us what you've been doing at this conference. Well, I'm from the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, and we're charged with defending uh, the civil rights, or you know, human rights is what you'd call them yes. in the international uh, arena, but civil rights, what we call them at home, uh, uh, freedom from discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, freedom from uh, you know, abuse by by law enforcement, freedom from uh, hate crimes, all of these things that make up uh, human rights or civil rights. And 
while the Civil Rights was, uh, Division was created to address the problem of racial discrimination, uh -huh. when Congress passed the 1964 Act, uh, Civil Rights Act in the United States, uh, they also uh, banned discrimination based on religion and national origin and, and gender. Okay. And so, and in, as our country has become more religiously diverse, we've seen uh, more cases of discrimination uh, based on religion. And it, it falls on our department to enforce these. And while race still remains sort of the, 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 the bulk of our work, more and more we're doing religious discrimination Because cases. a lot of times it's intertwined culturally and ethnicity. Certainly. Well. Certainly. Okay. And Asan, tell us why you're involved, Department of Homeland Security, in this wonderful conference. Well, I'd like to say thank you very much, Ambassador Cook and Welcome. Ambassador Kozak, for giving us the opportunity to speak here today and also be at the conference. Um, as Eric mentioned, um, uh, our department as well, uh, the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the Department of Homeland Security is empowered to uh, uh, enforce the civil rights laws of the United States, in particular as they relate to our department um, and our policy programs and personnel. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, is a very, very large federal government uh, department uh, and agency, the second largest in the federal government, and uh, we are responsible for transportation security and uh, immigration uh, security and controls. And as such, uh, our employees and personnel touch uh, um, a number of the U.S. public. We deal with a number of individuals across the United States. And so it's important in terms of the resolution uh, to, sh to highlight and showcase kind of the concrete positive steps we take to combat religious discrimination uh, or discrimination on the basis of religion or belief uh, at our department. So, so the conference is focusing on two effective sure. government strategies sure. to engage members and also uh, enforcing laws that prohibit right. acts of discrimination. Right. So your role, how do you connect the two? What does Department of Homeland Security contribute? Well, what we showcased at the, uh, at the conference and uh, what we do uh, in terms of the work we do at the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties uh, mm -hmm. primarily is our engagement mm -hmm. uh, work. We head out to about 14 cities across the United States six to eight times a year. We meet with civil rights advocates and community leaders. We connect them to uh, our uh, department, regional uh, uh, okay. leaders at our department, okay. as well as our colleagues from the Department of Justice and the Department of State and Transportation. We also conduct training uh, for our uh, personnel uh, and for other federal agencies on cultural competency, uh, uh, and we train uh, individuals on uh, um, uh, religious uh, competency. Okay. Um, and we also take complaints uh, based on uh, uh, discrimination, alleged discrimination on the basis of religion or belief. So these kind of best practices uh, were kind of our contribution to this And what conference. do you share, Eric? I mean, we're a country that has a lot, as you said, a very diverse culture. What are some of the things that you see repeatedly that you can share with this particular conference? Yeah, sure. I mean, we have long been a very diverse country religiously. Originally the diversity was within a multiplicity of Christian yes. denominations, but as it's grown there are more and more faith groups, thousands of different faith groups if you include uh, sub-sects uh, within yes. major faith groups in the United States. And we have some strong constitutional principles of free speech, free, uh, freedom of religion, separation of church and state. Uh, that protect uh, all of all of these groups, and so we've had a chance to showcase these uh, uh, and and talk about how do we enforce, how do we make these rights a reality? It's easy yes. to have these principles, which mm -hmm. are fine principles, but how do you uh, apply them where the rubber hits the road? And so it's 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 been great to to compare with uh, our our colleagues from other countries. You know, what are remedies if you have a case of discrimination? Uh, what you know, do we? go to court or other countries have an administrative remedy or if you're in court and you win uh, in our country we can order uh, you know, a, a change in behavior uh -huh. as well as damages if, if someone's discriminating sometimes retraining of officials on what the law is and then talking to other countries where well no they can only get monetary awards right. but not these other things and so we've they've been very interested in well what are the other types of remedies you can just to give some some examples I mean we yes. bring cases involving land disputes uh, with the economy down around the world and in the United States what we see is towns don't want 
another church, another synagogue, another mosque. Mm -hmm. They want a, a, a big a business that's going to give lots of jobs and lots yes. of tax revenue. So we lot, see a lot of discrimination. Uh, sometimes it's anti-Jewish discrimination, anti-Muslim discrimination, but sometimes it's just we don't want places of worship. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing this, and our colleagues in other countries are, are seeing this type of, of thing as well. So and what's important about this web that. chat is that we don't even know a lot of the things that we do in our own country. So it's important to showcase that, and it's important for you to let us know right. what you're doing. And we enforce it's, a law that yeah. protects places of worship from uh, arbitrary decisions by local zoning officials, as well as cases involving employment discrimination or discrimination in education. For, for students to be able to gather during school. And we don't have official religion in the United States. Right. You can't have a teacher leading a prayer. Exactly. But students are allowed to gather for prayer. So we've brought cases involving uh, uh, Muslim students who wanted to gather for prayer uh, at midday and the school officials weren't allowing them to, uh, even during lunch period, or Christian students who weren't allowed to gather for a Bible study, uh, mm -hmm. even though other kids could gather and, and play hacky sack and frisbee, but they, they couldn't have their Bible study. <laughs> exactly. So th these are cases that we've been gotten involved under our statutes, the civil rights statutes, saying, no, you have to uh, you know, treat religion equally. And so we've been sharing this with, with uh, our colleagues from other countries. Let me just ask on that, Ambassador Kozak, because we, we have been sharing for three days, and it's wonderful, and they're excited, engaged, and buzzing, actually. Mm -hmm. Which countries have been invited? I understand 30 were invited and 27 showed up. Yeah, Which, what are some of those countries? There, we basically could not, uh, just for sake of size, uh, have every country in the world. Though mm -hmm. I think we, that would be a nice thing to do in, mm -hmm. in one sense. But what we tried to do was go and pick countries from uh, a representative sample from each part of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got countries from, uh, from our own hemisphere, Canada, Brazil, Chile are, are uh, represented. Uh, we've got countries from Africa, uh, where Senegal is... Uh, and who uh, comes uh, from uh, these countries? Who's involved in this particular first implementation process? The, it's essentially uh, the counterparts of our Justice and, and uh, Department of Homeland Security. So it would be people from Ministries of Interior or Ministries of So it really is justice. an experts meeting, those yeah, who are exactly. involved in those two particular areas. And in some areas. cases we've had, we, we also have some, uh, some experts from uh, uh, the United Nations, for example, a uh, special rapporteur on uh, religious freedom yes. is, uh, was a participant uh, yesterday and has been a participant throughout the, the uh, course of the meeting. Can we talk a little bit about the structure of the meeting, how the three days have flowed, what has happened, uh, are there plenaries, are there engagement, what's happening? Well, we've had these uh, round table. The first day we were all together, then we've, we've split and uh, Essen and DHS folks have talked about community engagement and DHS is in one breakout Homeland session. Security. Yes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then DOJ, Department of Justice, has met talking specifically about religious discrimination okay. and hate crimes. Mm -hmm. How do we address the problem of fighting intolerance and uh, sometimes violent intolerance with the tools in, in each of our respective toolboxes mm -hmm. from each country? In the United States, we have uh, vigorous national hate crime statutes. If someone attack somebody because of their race or religion or burns a house of worship. The federal government can step in, prosecute, prosecute these as federal crimes, and uh, they can receive enhanced sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with discrimination. In employment, we can fight for people's right to take their faith with them into the workplace, that they don't have to hide their faith at home, that they can express their religion, mm -hmm. uh, that, that everyone is given an equal chance to participate in America, and that the, that the federal government has tools to make sure that's a reality. So is it just presentations or from the United States? Or is there any engagement with other countries? Are they presenting as well? No, absolutely. What, um, uh, what we've had uh, in terms of the, the work uh, that we did uh, during the first and second day at the uh, conference. The first day, uh, the Department of Homeland Security held a mock interactive okay. roundtable mm -hmm. where we invited uh, civil society um, um, from across the United States who we engage with on a regular basis, as well as our U.S. government uh, partners and our DHS uh, senior leadership. So there is a role for civil society. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and we showed how questions of discrimination on the basis of religion or belief arise domestically mm -hmm. and how our, how our department, right at the grassroots level, right at the beginning, where this resolution kind of starts. Mm -hmm. um, how do we deal with those issues right at that right at that moment? And then on the second day, we had a number of um, country participants uh, 
talk about some of the mechanisms that they use to address these issues as well. Okay. And it was a great discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, in, case you're in case you're just joining us, we're a web chat. We have Essen Zafar, who is a Senior Policy Advisor for the Department of Homeland Security. Next to him is Ambassador Mike Kozak, who's a Senior Advisor with DRL, Department of Rights and Labor, and Eric Treen, who's a Special Counsel for Religious Discrimination in the Department of Justice. And we welcome you in case you're just joining us. We, it is a web chat, so we do have a question from a viewer. Uh, first question is, combating intolerance and discrimination is not the same as protecting religious freedom, including in international law. Why is this used? Pastor Kozak, you want to talk about the international yeah. law aspect first, and then we can... Thank you for your question. Yep. Uh, I think it, it, the reason we focused in on that, on combating discrimination, mm -hmm. combating violence, and there's a whole series of other things in the title of 1618, uh, trying to uh, combat negative uh, uh, stereotypes Typing, and profiling exactly. mm -hmm. and, and so on, is that, that the uh, way we were able to achieve international consensus was to focus on actions that we all agreed are are bad and need to be dealt with in some fashion or another, and we also agreed on the kinds of tools that we that were appropriate to use for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, broader concepts of uh, of religious freedom. There are, there are disagreements about the the balance between uh, that uh, uh, human right and others. Uh, and I think the secret of 1618 is we said let's set aside the parts we don't agree on and focus on the part we do agree on, which is combating concrete acts of uh, discrimination, yes. violence, and so on, and, and try to, it doesn't diminish from the broader concepts of religious freedom that are set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh -huh. but, it, but it is trying to focus in on particular aspects and say what can we do about this uh, rather, than, uh, uh, rather than just continuing to have a, a debate that, that doesn't change so anything in real life. So you're focusing on practitioners, people who actually have the hands on it, actually doing the exactly, work. Exactly. We're going to share another example. Yeah, and I was going to say that uh, from a enforcement uh, perspective here in the United States, uh, you know, we view religious liberty, discrimination, and hate crimes as all of a piece. Yes. Uh, we are enforcing the right of people to uh, have a faith, have a strong faith, and participate in public life. So people can... And the right to choose that faith. And to choose that faith. Mm -hmm. So people can walk down the street without fear of being attacked because of the faith they they have or how they express that in exactly. clothing or, or you know, wearing a beard or things like that. That people can go to school mm -hmm. and carry a Bible with them or uh, people can go to work and uh, wear a cross right, or wear a turban. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are of a piece of protecting religious freedom, that fundamental freedom uh, that was so much a part of, our, of America's founding mm -hmm. and, bec and remains such an important principle today. Okay, so what happens after this conference, we have this conference for three days. Where does it go? What happens as a result of this? Well, this is where, when we talked about the countries participating, uh, the way of trying to engage all countries is that the the plan is we will prepare a, a report uh, based on what happened in the conference, mm -hmm. what ideas were put forth, which best practices and who will were that go to? demonstrated. And we're going to send that to the uh, Office of the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights at the United Nations so that they can then turn around and disseminate it more broadly. So the idea here is to draw expertise from around the world, mm -hmm. uh, talk about it, get, and we've had some re really interesting perspectives of different ways to engage, for example, with, with religious communities, and then put that back out there so that people have a, a chance to adopt some of those ideas in their own practice. Well, it's certainly been a buzz both during the breaks and during the sessions and people even offering to uh, um, host the next implementation. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to happen. But we have another question from a viewer, and thank you for your question. It says, would you agree that freedom of expression and religious freedom are complementary and not in conflict? Complementary and not in conflict. How would you answer that, Eric? Well, I think my previous answer uh, goes to that, that I do think they are complementary. They are part of that fundamental right of, of, of conscience and, uh -huh. and, and expression of one's deepest uh, uh, beliefs and values. Okay. Do you have Essen? I would just add that uh, one cannot exist without the other. I mean, there, there's a symbiosis in terms of uh, fighting for and encouraging religious freedom 
uh, that goes hand in hand with having the freedom of expression. Okay. And it's exciting to see the experts who have really been engaged actually shared some of their stories and, and, and challenges as well, because that's what helps us go forward in looking at our challenges. What are, uh, is there a role that diplomats can play? I know it's an experts meeting, but is there a role that diplomats can play in this conference? Well, we've had a couple of us that have uh, played the role of uh, sort of traffic cops for the, for the uh, meetings, uh, mm -hmm. calling on different yeah, delegations to speak. But the substantive uh, presenters have been our, our colleagues here mm -hmm. and their counterparts from, from other countries. But I think where the, where the diplomats will come back in again is in this dissemination of the, of the knowledge that, mm -hmm. we've, uh, that we've gained and hopefully will gain from, from future meetings on, on different aspects of 1618. So now, are there countries invited that have a poor record in terms of protecting religious minorities? Are they also invited? Yes. Uh, I, I'm mm -hmm. not going <laughs> to uh, single out countries here, but yeah. there, mm -hmm. there are, uh, I mean, it's the hope know, that every, they might learn from every country has problems, and, yes. and, and we including do ours, ours uh, including yeah. ours, and, and that was uh, described mm -hmm. as, as to some of the challenges we've faced and what we've done about it, and then others. One of the things we did in the conference was adopted what the so-called Chatham House rules, where okay. everybody can talk freely, but nobody's going to quote them unless they That's give important. permission, and that was with the view of trying to get people to not just uh, sit there and make speeches about how wonderful their country is, right. but instead say, look, we faced this problem last year and we were up against this mm -hmm. aspect of it and here's what we did and it worked or here's what we did and it and it didn't work. Exactly. Uh, you were going to ask? Answer. Well, I was just going to kind of go off the, 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 the point that you made about Chatham House Rules and how it relates to the work we do and, uh, and also freedom of expression. Uh, I, I think it's very important to build trust mm -hmm. um, when we do this kind of work, when we discuss these sensitive issues. Um, especially given the variety of faiths that many na country participants, including the United States, um, have. Um, you know, it's very important to have the ability to speak freely uh, and discuss your viewpoints uh, on these issues of uh, discrimination on the basis of religion or belief. Let's stay on that point for a minute. Sure. Won't speech bans necessarily come up because many foreign governments see these as a tool to fight discrimination? Won't that naturally come up in these discussions? Well, 1618 actually provides for speech bans in one narrow instance, which is a speech that constitutes incitement to imminent violence, which okay. is also the standard that, uh, that the U.S. Yeah. follows. Mm -hmm. If somebody gets out there and mm -hmm. has a, a group and says, let's go now and attack right. that person because of their religion and belief, that you can, you can stop. Mm -hmm. Now, other countries have adopted different uh, standards uh, on, on how far you can go in this regard. Uh, not only is there disagreement about it, but it also has a, a perverse effect in a way. We've seen some countries okay. say, well, if it's not illegal, then it's okay. Mm. So if, if it doesn't fall within what they think is uh, speech that can be banned, then their attitude is, well, if, if somebody does something short of that, we shouldn't care about it. And that's not a good attitude either, because we've, we've seen instances of you know, deliberate, hateful mm -hmm. uh, activity, and even even though you, people have a right to be awful mm -hmm. and to express awful views, other people have a right to express counter views, and that's that, and true. that's what we're tr trying to say is that needs to be used. And Secretary Clinton said in uh, in Istanbul that you can't make, and the President has said you can't make bad ideas go away, mm -hmm. but you can you can combat them with good ideas with, yes. and that the solution to bad expression is more expression. So this is the compatibility of religious freedom and, and uh, freedom of expression again, is that freedom of expression is probably the strongest tool mm -hmm. you can use to, to combat assaults on uh, freedom of religion or belief. And I would add on that that uh, somebody I respect very much uh, used to point out all the time, you can't really have religious belief without having the freedom not to have a belief. Exactly. Because if you, exactly. if, you, if you have no choice but to believe in something, then it's not a belief. Uh, right. it's, a, it's an obligation. But if you, if you have a choice right to believe or, not. or not to believe. Yeah, we and have so to make sure we that's, emphasize that yeah, well. and that. And so we're, de we're defending that as well. But I think what, what's come out of this process is that instead of focusing just on these, what are the appropriate uh, limitations on freedom of speech, and mm -hmm. how, how might that conflict with, uh, with uh, other ones, we said, what are, the, what are the ways that you can go about attacking the problem of discrimination or, or other 
hateful and, and uh, bad behavior uh, based so on... So you shift the focus. Yeah, exactly. and, and, mm -hmm. and, and what are the tools we all agree are appropriate to that. Exactly. And then the ones where we don't agree, we'll set them over here instead of having that become the center of the... Uh, and we get stuck there. Let's go yeah. to what does work. You were going to add, Eric? I was say, one of the things we've been showing from a Department of Justice enforcement perspective to the other delegates is that, yes, we have strong uh, protections of religious, uh, of free speech mm -hmm. here, uh, to say all sorts of hateful things, but in, sp in spite of that, we are able to vigorously protect people from discrimination, from hate crimes, yes. from threats. If someone threatens you with violence, says, I'm going, I'm going to hurt you or your family, that is a crime. It's an, you, know, you use words to describe it, but in the law, that's an act. That, yes. The same thing in discrimination. If you have an employee who is being uh, uh, harassed by, by fellow employees and the supervisor's not doing about it, that's discrimination. And even though it involves people saying words, that can be a, a, a form of, of discrimination that mm -hmm. is actionable. Exactly. Um, and so to make that, that clear that mm -hmm. we are not just allowing people to, to face all sorts of, of, of violence, threats, uh, harassment in the workplace, harassment in bullying in schools, uh, that we have vigorous protections that protect our First Amendment free speech values and also protect people's uh, religious uh, rights as well. Thank you. In case you're just joining us, this is a live web chat coming from the United States Department of State. I'm Susan Johnson Cook, Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. We have Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, and DRL here this morning. And we have a comment from a viewer. We welcome all of you who join us from all over the world. Uh, a comment from a viewer says, it's hard because the people we may view as most ignorant will have no interest in dialogue. It takes a community to change behavior. How do you respond to that? Well, um, uh, that's a great question, and uh, thank you for that question. I think um, the name of one of our sections that does a lot of this work, the community engagement section, um, says a lot about the role and the responsibility that the government has, uh, specifically our department when we deal with our issues, to head out there and talk to these communities, um, engage them in the process, invite them to the table. The convening authority that we have, mm -hmm. um, I think, helps us surmount uh, that issue. Um, and, and we work really hard uh, at the Department of Homeland Security, at the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, to ensure that participation is broad mm -hmm. uh, across the spectrum, across the faith-based spectrum. Uh, from the smallest communities in some of the smallest towns across the country mm -hmm. to the largest national organizations that are out there. Talk a little so. bit about community engagement section. What's your goal? How do, when you go into a community, where do you go? When you, do you just show up and you're at you know, Highway 101? What, what happens? Well, so j in terms of what we do, we've, we started uh, several years back. The Department of Homeland Security is only about nine years old, a little bit less than yes. nine years old. But since the beginning, uh, we started engaging with these communities and we've started uh, with the larger cities that have diverse faith-based populations uh, such as Los Angeles and uh, uh, Boston and mm -hmm. Houston and then what we do is we start with the larger organizations build trust with them and keep working our way down mm -hmm. uh, we've engaged with interest groups faith-based interest groups and other interest groups uh, with very very small constituencies uh, of up to two three hundred folks apiece we bring them to the table uh, we uh, encourage them, as we've spoken about in terms of certain limits, to, to speak freely about the issues that they're facing. And then we connect them to the regional leadership mm -hmm. uh, on the ground to ensure that their civil rights issues are, are not unheard and that they're, they're, uh, we take proactive steps to address discrimination. Uh, and you're saying Department of Homeland Security is only nine years old, just roughly? That's right. Was We're it in response department. to the 9-11 attacks, or what, is that how it was absolutely, created? Absolutely, absolutely. The mm -hmm. Department of Homeland Security arose uh, in direct response to the attacks of 9-11, yes. And the Secretary, Janet Napolitano. That's that right. That we see all That's the right. time. My okay. boss, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, is very, very interested in this initiative. She's just, uh, we've been recently authorized to expand our engagement, so we'll be heading to even more cities. Mm -hmm. And we also bring in our colleagues from the Department of Justice, like Eric Treen. Eric and I work very closely together, as well as other, other agencies, such as the FBI and the Department of Transport. It's a whole government effort. It's a and one it's government effort. And it's great to see effort. that whole government interagency effort. Do you want to add to that? I was just going to add that the, the education piece, reaching mm -hmm. out to communities, is key. Uh, Tom Perez, who's our mm -hmm. Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, who spoke yes. at the opening of the conference, 
uh, likes to say that today's bullies are tomorrow's hate crime defendants. Ah. That, you know, it's important to, to get people young when they can learn about others and learn about toleration uh -huh. towards others. Education is key. In, in, this, in the uh, Department of Justice, we have a, a unit called the Community Relations Service, yes. which goes out. They don't have any enforcement power, but their role is to go into communities. They do cultural competency training for police uh -huh. when there are community conflicts. Sometimes like, uh, there'll be a, a, a protest for the KKK, Ku Klux Klan is, is protesting uh, anti-black speech, and then there'll be counter-protesters, and they'll go out, talk to each side, talk to the police, try to, to uh, make sure that, the, that everything remains peaceful mm -hmm. and everyone's allowed to express themselves, but yet um, uh, that, that people can at, at least you know, res respect each other to some degree. And, certain, and there are other conflicts, say, between, if, if a mosque wants to build and there's mm -hmm. misunderstanding and neighbors are protesting, they'll come in and get people to sit down. And it may be that people are just concerned about noise. And that's their main, there may be a few bigots in the group, but mm -hmm. other people are more concerned about noise and, and an unfamiliar uh, worship that, and they don't know when it is, what day it is. And you, you talk through those things, and, you, and a lot of these problems can go away. All right, so you can prevent some things if you have some time to talk it through, right. listening and learning right. from one another. Now, there are always going to be these bigots who exactly. aren't going to respond to anything except, you know, a lawsuit. But exactly. that's not always the case. And also, to just from the kind of, to, to, as a highlight from the ground level, to see it from the grassroots level, an important part is building relationships. Yes. One of the stories that we discussed uh, from our experiences was a number of sick Americans uh, that were flying into an airport, five, six hundred of them. And as you know, practicing sick Americans wear the turban and the articles of faith, uh, which create certain challenges for airport security uh, in terms of the equipment and the scanning. And they presented at this round table at Houston these issues uh, that will there'll be a number of us coming in on one day. And the, you know, the TSA chief at the airport, the FSD, raised his hand. He said, you know what, not a problem. Wow. Let's work together. Let's ensure that when you arrive at the airport that our national security remains intact and our security policies and procedures remain in effect. Yes. But let's make sure that the TSA officers know that you're coming in, Yes. Uh, that they're retrained. We have certain policies and procedures that respect the dignity and the rights of individuals. To, but we just no have to communicate. What, right, no matter yeah. what faith mm -hmm. traditions. Mm -hmm. and, and everything went without a hitch and, um, and everything works smoothly. And so that's also part of uh, the engagement process is working right at the grassroots level to ensure that uh, all faith-based communities are treated with dignity and respect. Let's talk a little bit about the young, young people aspect again sure. because when you have experts, they're usually seasoned people. In terms of going forward with this implementation, how do we deal and engage young people? Go ahead, that's, an important well, that's a great idea. I mean, uh, the Department of Justice and Education with the leadership of the White House have been uh, doing various bullying initiatives around the country uh, to highlight the fact uh, you know kids need to be able to, to to be educated in a safe secure environment and not be you know attacked uh, because of their religion or any re uh -huh. reason really um, and so that's been been an important initiative we're working closely with the department of education on that so are you inviting some young leaders to the table to share from their perspective you know, we do uh -huh. we bring in folks a lot of there's some uh, muslim and arab groups that have summer programs uh -huh. or leadership programs and we always uh, bring them in and speak uh -huh. to them uh, and it's, it's something we need to do more of yeah because that's going to they are our future not they are present but they're also very much our future as well yeah I was going to add that we actually have um, a very robust um, what we call an academic engagement program mm -hmm. which will be supplemented uh, later this year with a campus engagement program where we bring in uh, young Jewish leaders, Catholic American leaders, Muslim American leaders across faith-based traditions mm -hmm. uh, together uh, for a, a couple of days. We sit down and we discuss with them what are the issues that you're having from a young adult perspective, yeah. uh, either with the federal government or with national security. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is because we find that young adults are often the ones that are affected by government policy the most, mm -hmm. national security policy the most, their civil rights uh, are sometimes endangered by some of the actions. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, they lack some of the tools that older uh, individuals have the tools to engage with their federal government to raise their voice and kind of make themselves heard. Um, and, and we also do a lot of interactive tabletop exercises uh -huh. and kind of get them involved. And we get 
frankly, fantastic feedback uh, from these individuals. Yeah. Then I have to give a shout out to the International Religious Freedom Team or the Earth Team because we have some really talented young adults who really helped put this conference together, Nazreen and Darren and Rachel and certainly our whole Earth staff. So we want to give a shout out to our young adults who are in government really making a difference. Our directors, Victoria Alvarado and Carrie Johnson is our deputy. So the whole Earth Team, I want to thank you for all of your work and all the volunteers across the agencies and bureaus who have helped us put this together. We have a question from online, and I just want to raise this question. It says, which aspects of religious freedom are most at risk in the world today? Which aspects of religious freedom are most at risk in the world today? Ambassador Kozak. Well, I, I would take a stab at it and say it's really the fundamental one, which is the, the right to be able to choose your own belief and to, and to change your, your own beliefs uh, and, and, and freely and without uh, uh, adverse consequence to you. Uh -huh. I mean, we see the way the adverse consequences are done are different in different parts of the world. In some places, uh, people are ha have a hard time getting the identity cards they need to do their business in society unless they belong to, you know, one particular religion or, uh -huh. or one of several uh, privileged religions. Yes. Uh, in other places, uh, we, we see regulations that prevent uh, people from creating houses of worship for uh, all but one kind of religion. In some places, you have the extremes of blasphemy laws where one privileged religion says anybody who says something that we find uh, offensive uh, can be put to death uh, in, in some extreme circumstances. Let's talk a little so more about a blasphemy law you know, because in our constitution, we're protected. Talk about blasphemy because that does not happen all around the world. You want to yeah. elaborate on that? Well, I mean, we, we abolished uh, blasphemy laws back in the, in the colonial period. Mm. So uh, the domestic experience probably uh, uh, doesn't shed much. So I, I defer to. Uh, what? Okay, define yes. blasphemy for those who may just be joining us and may not no, be as no, familiar with it. Some countries have laws that basically say if you say something that is insulting to or disagrees with the official interpretation of a particular religion, that that's a crime. Mm -hmm. And that the state can then take action against you for, for committing uh, that crime. And how does that and differ from apostasy? Is there, are they related? Well, I think apostasy is probably more uh, the, the, the theological side of it, mm -hmm. that you, you mm -hmm. could say to somebody, you're, you're going off on a uh, tangent here that isn't a approved uh, doctrine of our church or mm -hmm. our, our faith. But, but it's when you bring the state into it and say that the state is now going to punish people for doing that. And we've seen cases, and actually it was very interesting uh, yesterday that some of the participants pointed out that often this is used for political reasons, that it's not really a clash between uh, different religious faiths, but it's, a, it's people who are trying to further their own political uh, future will say, well, uh, we need to punish this group over here, or we need to punish this individual for deviating from the correct line. But in fact, what they're deviating from is the government's uh, political line. Yes. And okay. so it's it's a very dangerous area to get into. So you see that as one of the most important risks. Yeah, but it's but I think all of these are of a piece. That's mm -hmm. the most extreme. Mm -hmm. Saying if you if you uh, say something that is deemed contrary by the government, deemed contrary to the dominant faith, mm -hmm. you can be punished that's that uh, you know that's a very extreme penalty but there are lesser ones too that are that also get in the way of people professing their own uh, practicing their own uh, faith you uh, wanted to add Eric? well I wanted to, to respond to the to the, uh, the, the caller or writer yeah. um, that uh, from a domestic standpoint in, in what we see in the United States is as the biggest uh, religious liberty problem and it's something I do see in other countries. I'm not. I'm not the expert on. And let me know because I'm the religious freedom the expert, ambassador, so I need to know. I have seen this uh, in my 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 watching of the work you do. Mm -hmm. Is the part of Article 18 that says uh, worship alone or in community with others? Mm -hmm. It's the community with others that's the that's the real issue in the United States right now, which is finding a place to worship. Congress in the year 2000 unanimously passed a law to protect the ability of places of worship to locate. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, economic times as they are, uh, we find discrimination not only against minority faiths, but against uh, Christian denominations that want to locate because people would rather have a Walmart than have a church. Uh -huh. uh, we have, uh, right now, mosques are, are, are meeting a lot of opposition in communities where they're trying to locate. Uh, people are unfamiliar with them, and they're, they're, they're saying, no, we don't, we don't 
need that in, the, in our neighborhood. That is, is a problem that we're so, facing. And I was just over in Spain uh, talking to civil yeah, society Barcelona, over there in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And they're having a real problem with that over there as well. And mm -hmm. I've seen it. I know it's, it's a problem in Vietnam and other places around the world and in, in different degrees. Of course, in the U.S., typically you can find a place. It's you know, maybe more costly. It's, you don't have to register. So the barriers are a little different. But what is the systemic cause, though? Why are people saying not in my backyard? What's underlying all of that? Is it? They're different things. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's bias. Sometimes it's we don't want Orthodox Jews in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's uh, people who see that there are established churches there. There's the First Methodist Church, the First Presbyterian, Presbyterian. Church. Mm -hmm. And why, do they, why does this evangelical church have to open a storefront with 30 people mm -hmm. in it? Uh, I want that storefront to be a Starbucks. Okay. But, you know, in American law, mm -hmm if you own property, you should be able to use it peacefully, right? Yes. And so um, if they don't want to have a Starbucks, if they want to use their property to have a church, that's their right. Mm -hmm. And so we're fighting for that right here. Okay. And it's a little different from what you see overseas, but in general, it comes down to the ability not only to have your own faith in your heart, but to join with others and, uh, and worship and express that faith. Ambassador Kozak? I was going to just add that one of the things that we learned from some of our colleagues the other day is that in parts of the world, and I think Eric was alluding to it, that it's not you know one faith being pitted against others, mm -hmm. that it's often uh, the, the people have a problem with any house of worship. And we, we saw that uh, some countries were saying that that's what they're, what they're experiencing. The other thing we saw when we go to back to the previous question about about engaging communities yes. that I was really interested in watching the exercises you all put on was that they get representatives of all different faiths and and uh, and non-governmental organizations some of which are not faith-based in the room together and oftentimes the concerns they have are the same like we learned when TSA was instituting these uh, body scanners mm -hmm. that there were there were real problems raised about that from a religious standpoint but it was it was privacy concerns, but it was it was the Jewish community, the Catholic community, the Muslim community, and the Sikh community all had the same concerns, mm. and Across joined the board. and joined together and said, "Look, this is not acceptable to us." And and TSA went back and re-engineered how they how they did the body scans to do to have a generic body rather than the individual body show up. Excellent. So, but it, to me, what was interesting there was that it, the, often this issue is is seen in terms of one faith against another, whereas often it's, it's the same, the, the whole range of faiths having similar concerns okay. and, tr and trying to uh, get society to, to deal with those. That's something you were going to add? I was mm -hmm. just going to say, uh, going directly off what, he, what you said, uh, Ambassador Kozak, my small addition to this would be from our experience that some of the largest kind of issues of uh, discrimination on the basis of religion or belief are really issues of privacy sometimes, uh -huh. or they're issues of um, um, dealing kind of broader issues that just affect faith-based communities uh, uh, in general, but also affect communities uh, who hail from no faith-based tradition. Uh -huh, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. so. Let me just ask you, I mean, not only do we need to focus on youth as we go forward, also the, the women in religious freedom. I, I noticed in terms of the experts that they hear, there's really only one female from Nigeria who's at the table. So as we go forward, we're talking about the whole subject of religious freedom and looking at experts. We have to make sure that all, all voices are included at the table. Do you have any comments in terms of women and religious freedom? No, I, I'll, I'll say I've noticed the same thing. In, okay. Not just at this conference, mm -hmm. but in general, that often you see more male voices in religious liberty because maybe that's what people are interested in and they go into the field or so forth. But we certainly, like we have Vicki Schultz, who's the, the yeah. Deputy Assistant Attorney General, uh, uh, moderated the first session yesterday okay. on behalf of the Department of Justice. So I was very pleased to have her there. She's uh, very active yeah. in, uh, in these issues at the Department of Justice. But uh, yes, that's certainly something we should be aware of. Yeah. I was going to add that actually you do see that, and I saw that uh, at, at the conference as well. But what I'm also seeing is a trend. Um, I'm seeing that it shift. I'm yeah. seeing that the trend change. So if you go back 30 or 40 years, you'll see individuals that either are working on issues of religious discrimination or the kind of organizations leading the charge generally uh, led and staffed by um, uh, men. Uh -huh. But that is changing. And you see changing. the shift. Absolutely. All right, because yeah. I'm well, here the now. Yes, the, the shift, shift is right here. here. I'm here now. Okay. <laughs> I mean, our officer yes. for civil rights and civil liberties is a, is, a, is, a, is a women's rights advocate, Margot Schlanger, uh -huh. and uh, 
Uh, for instance, the president of the Islamic Society of North America, uh, the recent president, uh, was was also uh, a woman. So it's it's shift, it's slow. Okay, it's slow, yeah, okay. but it's changing. But it's changing. Okay. Your yeah. staff has many. And, and both, staff, women. Yeah, exactly. both the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security are committed to, to seeing this change. Take and place. internationally, it's shifting. So I was at the Vatican and. Uh, three of the ambassadors to the Holy See are now female as well. So it is shifting, and Absolutely. so that's good. But just as we go forward in the next host, we want to make sure that women well, are at the table Sure, I mean, well. if you're going to talk about head coverings mm -hmm. and modesty, sure. it, how can exactly. you have men talking about yeah. modesty? Maybe men, men can contribute to that debate, but you, you need a female voice too. Thank you. I just wanted to just register that as well. And I left <laughs> out Samir and Arcelin and Amy for our young adults and the whole Earth team. It's been wonderful having you. Uh, we just want to thank you for joining us this morning. It's been an engaging, wonderful, buzzing conversation. We're getting ready to start day number three here. Wherever you are in the world, we want to thank you for joining us and tuning in. Again, we want to thank Ambassador Michael Kozak from DRL and Eric Treen from the Department of Justice and Essen Zafar from the Department of Homeland Security. I'm Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook, and we wish you a happy holiday season. However you celebrate, may you have a wonderful, wonderful end of this year and the beginning of the next new year. Thank you for joining us and thank you to the International Religious Freedom Team and Secretary Clinton, our Secretary for the United States Department of State for hosting this conference. It has been my pleasure.